Hamid Karzai was president of Afghanistan for more than 10 years, and yet now, in retirement, he says America's stated objective of defeating terrorism did not happen. It was tragic for the Afghan people. So what of the future for his country? Well, he sees a better relationship with Pakistan under its new prime minister, Imran Khan. And what about running for the Afghan presidency again? We get a categorical answer. I'm David Foster. You're watching One on One on TRT World. It's a number of years since you mm -hmm. were president of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and yet recently you've been outspoken mm -hmm. about a number of things in the country, saying, for instance, very recently, that you felt let down by the Americans. Right. In what sense? In lots of ways. In 2002, when we began the journey together after the tragedy of September 11 and the arrival of the United States, uh, backed by the entire world, uh, the United Nations, uh, and uh, even countries who were rivals with them still backed them in Afghanistan, cooperated with them. That, that coming of the United States and its allies offered tremendous hope to the Afghan people. <clears throat> uh, one of peace, uh, of stability, and of progress, and of a fundamental change for Afghanistan towards the betterment of life. Initially, that happened. Uh, the country became peaceful. We were united again. We got our constitution. We um, uh, got our flag back and all that. But then the one most important aspect of this, which was the return of security and peace to Afghanistan, soon began to look like it wasn't going to be there. And then we began to talk to America, uh, to the presidents, to the officials, about the difficulties and the problems that we saw were coming that they did not address. On the contrary, <clears throat> they began to wage a war in our homes and villages where you would neither find an extremist nor um, have an extremist, or all that uh, which they always said they were fighting. That led to, to the first emergence of differences, civilian casualties, were the first reason and the fundamental reason for my differences with America. And then it grew into lots of other issues. Why do you think civilians became such a target? I wish I knew the answer as far as, as, far as the Americans were concerned. Well, disregard? Could be that. Could be uh, disregard, could be carelessness, could be um, uh, just a very thoughtless uh, policy, or, or even, which frightens me a lot, could be deliberate. It was this the deliberate part that angered me, that angered the Afghan people. It was this thought in us that, well, we have been telling them for so long. Why don't they change? Then there must be something deliberate in it. And that I stood to oppose. You must have thought, if it even crossed your mind initially that it was deliberate, you must have thought about why it would have been deliberate. <coughs> Could you ever yes. come up with a reason? Exactly. <clears throat> and that is the cause, the root cause of uh, the differences that I developed with the United States and continue to have with the U.S. I felt that if we thought they were deliberately targeting the Afghan people, then they had a purpose. And the purpose is beyond Afghanistan in a global strategic uh, uh, design for which the Americans uh, are using Afghanistan and in the pursuit of which they need chaos and uh, upheavals and fighting and all of that to justify. <clears throat> it was precisely this element uh, in this whole scheme of things uh, that uh, brought me to confront the United States because I thought, well, you can have a big plan for yourself. You're a huge country. You can have a big design, a global design, 
but don't implement it at the cost of the Afghan people. So you said to them, it seems to me you are deliberately trying to destroy my country and destroy my people for your own ends. What yes. ends do you believe they were? You say you, they wanted chaos there, they, but why would they want to foment chaos? <clears throat> As I mentioned, probably part of their global agenda. But uh, where did that fit into a global agenda? Well, that I can't answer. Uh, that, that the Americans may, may be able to answer if they ever want to answer. That is what I felt, that Afghanistan and its people, the land, the people, were used in a bigger agenda. And when many years on, uh, four years ago, we saw the arrival of uh, the Islamic State in Afghanistan, Daesh, as it is also called, then that confirmed in, 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 in a very serious way my own uh, doubts about their strategy and the purposes. Why would the American presence, which was supposed to kill and remove and uh, uh, extremism and free us all from extremism and terrorism, why did their presence add to it? But were there things that you, as president of Afghanistan and the Afghan people themselves, could have done and should have done better, not just in welcoming the American troops, but to rebuild your country? We did that. We did that. Look. Unqualified success? We, we did that. We did that. We, no, we had our mistakes, surely. But on the grander scheme of things, we did all the right things. We, we, we suddenly became a country that had all its people back in it, a united country with all Afghans returning to it. We developed our constitution, and the Afghan people got together and ratified it, a very democratic constitution. We returned the right of Afghan women back to them. They went to schools and education and to government and businesses. We uh, brought democracy, elections. People participated from all walks of life, from all over the country. Uh, the media, the freedom of the media in Afghanistan is unprecedented in that part of the world. We did all the things that us and the international community thought were the right uh, prescriptions for Afghanistan. And yet, and in terms yet, of the global corruption index, Afghanistan is very near the botting, bottom. It has been said that you as president, in that, quotes, winked at corruption. That, that, that is something to talk about, yes. Afghanistan was a very poor country, rather a devastated country, because of years of war and interference. And suddenly the U.S. comes with huge amounts of money. That huge amount of money in Afghanistan was not spent by the Afghan government. It was spent by the U.S. directly. If you look into the accounts of the World Bank and IMF, which I don't favor much, but still, they uh, did studies in which the improvement in the fiscal management of the Afghan uh, um, uh, government, the Minister of Finance and others, was, was improving rapidly. From nothing, we created an administration, erected a structure and all of that. So, corruption, yes, there was in Afghanistan. Where corruption was ours, was in the day-to-day -day delivery of services. So you can absolve yourself and the government from no. any sort of blame no, no, and all no, the no, money no. that disappeared? No, 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 We do blame ourselves for the day-to-day -day corruption in the delivery of services, the small-scale thing like you have in many parts of the world, like our countries like us. But the big corruption of millions of dollars and the wastage of resources is entirely uh, the result of the contracting mechanism uh, adopted by the United States. Personal criticisms, mm -hmm. there'll be many of them, I should think, mm -hmm. you're used to them. One of them, as well as the fact that it is said you winked at corruption, you've addressed that, mm -hmm. is that you ruled like a tribal chief. Compliment or criticism? Oh, it's a compliment. <laughs> It's a compliment for a country like ours. Um, they, they don't understand. Some, some, some in the West will say tribal. They, they envision something else. For us, it's a system 
uh, of social interaction that allows people to freely come and meet you and, and talk to you and bring their, 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 their problems. It's, uh, it's more uh, dissemination of, of power and authority in a constitutive manner to, to the people. And that was a very successful form of government. Look, my government was strong and united. It kept the unity of the country. And it was extremely aware of the goings on in the country. Probably that's what the US didn't want. They didn't want me to be aware of what was happening in the country. Through the institutions, I could not get that information. It was through my contacts with the people in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. all over the country, that established that. And it was that form of activity which enabled me. Let me ask you why Afghanistan matters, not, not to you, I mean, Karzai, as mm -hmm. ex-president, as, as a, a countryman, mm -hmm. but why it matters to the world. Um, and then I'll get on to some suggestions that have mm -hmm. come out of the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs about it, possible problems that might arise. So why do you think we should still care about Afghanistan? Billions have been spent there, lives have been lost there. Uh, the country's, in the opinion of a lot of people, not in much greater shape than it was 17 years ago. So why should we care? In some areas it is. Better education, better health care, um, a constitution that we hope we will retain and, and not, uh, uh, not violate. Uh, but in some areas, not so well. Security, lack of peace, uh, the spread of extremism, the arrival of the Islamic State or Daesh, all of those are the negatives. Why care about Afghanistan? Afghanistan is in an extremely important part of the world. It is in the neighborhood of all the superpowers of the day. Russia is there, China's our neighbor, India is there, and regional powers, big powers. Don't forget Pakistan. Iran is there, Pakistan is there, Turkey is a great country in this, in this neighborhood. So we, uh, we matter because of uh, our location. Geography can, can be a curse, can be a blessing too. We pro probably have both of them there uh, as a fact for us. So we matter for all sorts of reasons. So you matter to the outside world because of, of, of where you are. You matter to yourselves because you love your country. Of course. When you see international players using it as a, a, effectively a playground for their international ambitions, it must be desperately saddening for you. And this it has is. been said by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. It is. An official yesterday. It is. Yeah. Yes, it is. He it said is. he thinks that the next big American conflict is going to be with Russia. In, well, I hope not. In Afghanistan, because he's likening it to the Ukraine. Well, I hope not. We should not allow that. Russia cooperated with America from 2002 onwards to 2014. Uh, I remember in a conversation with, with uh, President Putin in Shanghai, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, uh, Summit, I complained to President Putin about the uh, U.S. Uh, conduct in Afghanistan and the way they were implementing the war on extremism. Exactly as I mentioned earlier, that this was causing more trouble in Afghanistan than, than, than uh, solving things. He told me, he said, Mr. President, we and the United States may have uh, differences of views on lots of issues around the world, but on Afghanistan, we see eye to eye with America. This was in 2008. So the Russians, the Russian government, President Putin and uh, President Medvedev um, after that, and then again President Putin, they have been trying their best to be cooperative with the US. They allowed supplies. Um, you don't see things supplies. changing? Things have changed drastically today. In the past five years, things have changed drastically because of the, uh, the, uh, the arrival of the Islamic State in Afghanistan. Daesh uh, in Afghanistan, because of the increase in extremism and terrorism in Afghanistan, because of the continuity of conflict and, 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 and fighting in Afghanistan, the Americans cannot explain this to the region. This has to be explained. Why have they failed? And Daesh has to be explained. So Russia and China and reasonably all other neighbors are worried. Uh, how come? 
there are these extremist groups. While the U.S.'s presence in Afghanistan is exactly to fight extremist groups, you see, they keep increasing. It seems to me, to some extent, yes. that you try and paint a far rosier picture of Afghanistan than the rest of the world sees. Um, hmm. You have suggested in an interview with another TV station a number of years ago um, that al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is, for me, this is for you, a myth. You don't believe the 9-11 attacks, you said, were plotted no. in Afghanistan. No, I didn't say I didn't believe the 9-11 attacks. Those were true. We saw how those uh, towers were burned. No, no, I'm, the quote I'm putting to you mm. is that you said to this news organization you didn't believe the attacks were plotted in Afghanistan. Oh, and in, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. From Afghanistan, yes. Yes. I, yes, I still don't believe that was the case. And that al-Qaeda in your country was a myth. Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, I believe, is a myth. And this is because of my conversations uh, with the uh, very authoritative uh, U.S. Uh, uh, military personnel. Uh, I have asked them, how many are there in Afghanistan? At one stage, one of the senior most officials uh, of uh, the U.S. military in Afghanistan told me, this is in 2013, that the al-Qaeda is not uh, in number, there are not more than 35 in Afghanistan. I said, do you mean leaders of the Al-Qaeda or the entire thing? Do you include bin Laden in this? Bin Laden was dead then. Well, so we're not, not, I'm talking about during the early part of the 21st century, 2000, 2001, when well, the attacks were being planned. Do you think he was not there? He was in Afghanistan, yes. And he but was he plotting left. the attacks? But then we don't know that if he did it from Afghanistan. Well, there's something that I'm not, uh, you know, I have to be completely aware of something. What I'm, what I'm leading to is your, your continual suggestion that it's not Afghanistan, but that it's Pakistan no, to blame I'm not for saying, most of these No, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that either. But you have suggested Pakistan is in the a, villain in, in the region in a so different many way, times. In a different way, yes, with regard to Afghanistan, not with regard to Al-Qaeda. With regard to Afghanistan, Pakistan has been behaving extremely negatively. Pakistan has been supporting extremism against us, and for a long time, and for a long time also together with the United States. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, it was Pakistan and the United States together who supported extremism and who brought them from all over the world to Afghanistan. So that's a different story. Uh, but I'm talking of uh, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, my conversation with U.S. officials have never made me believe or, and have never heard from them that there were more than 35 al-Qaeda present in Afghanistan, individuals. The highest that they mentioned to me was a year before that, 2012, they said maybe around 80. So that's why I said al-Qaeda is a myth in Afghanistan. You can't have uh, 35 people um, uh, called al-Qaeda, and then to defeat them, you bring in 150,000 troops and create uh, seven or eight bases. No. May we talk a little bit about the future? Yes. Um, because we've addressed many issues in the past, and I've just been talking about Pakistan with you. New prime minister in that country. I believe that you think he offers hope for the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan if he does what? If he envisions a better future for, for, for his country, which will translate also into better relations with Afghanistan. Uh, we are a country affected more severely by uh, climate change. There is less and less water available. The population is increasing. Uh, opportunities uh, uh, slipping away. Any wise citizen of that region should be looking towards cooperation and ease of movement and economic activity and trade and looking and finding ways to address the shortages that we have in natural resources, especially in water. Uh, we from Afghanistan would offer every opportunity and help 
we will take many steps for one step that our brothers and sisters in Pakistan take towards the improvement of relations. Do you think he is the, the best hope that your country has had of a good relationship with Pakistan in a generation? I hope so. I hope he is. Uh, you hope so, but do you believe he is? Well, I have to, I will believe it when I see that, that he does the right thing. And we encourage him, we want him, we, 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 uh, we hope he will do the right thing. And, and, and we will also do the right thing if they take a step in the right direction. You have also said you believe that you could work with Donald Trump. You're critical of the United States past mistakes. Yes. But you have said you could work with yes. Donald Trump. What do you see in him? with regard to your country? Well, he's the elected president of the United States. He's the leader of that country, and he decides for that country. But he's isolationist. He doesn't <clears throat> care too much about what happens in other countries, as he expresses on a daily basis. Yes, but, but if he wants to work for, towards betterment of things, we will work with him. Which leads me to ask you a question about your future, because you're putting an olive branch out, if you like, towards Pakistan, to the, yes. to the president there. You're putting a hand of friendship out towards Donald Trump, a man that not an awful lot of people are offering a hand of friendship to on a genuine yes. basis. You have said you might consider running for the presidency again if enough political groups and people ask for it. What is your position? No. I will not run for the president of the country. What I meant there was that my priority as the citizen of Afghanistan and as the citizen of that region is for peace to return to Afghanistan and for harmony to return between, in relations between us and Pakistan. And towards that, the return of peace and stability for Afghanistan if enough political groups ask me to play a role, I'll be very happy to do it, but not becoming a president at all, no. So perhaps as an elder statesman, yes. even though you're only 60, you could be an elder yes. statesman, yes. you are categorically ruling out on this program, on TRT World, even though you've been hesitant about doing so in the past, that you will run for the presidency again. No, no, I've been very categorical in the past as well. I will not run for the president of the country. I've had enough of that. I did it for 13 years, and I did it pretty well, and it's enough. I want the younger generation of Afghans to come and take lead in, in, in on our country. But I also want to offer, as a citizen of Afghanistan, as someone who was in charge of that country's um, um, you know, running and governance for 13 years, advice to especially Pakistan and America that if they mean well they can do things differently and better in Afghanistan and with the Afghan people. And there, I'm willing to offer my help as the citizen of that country. I want to go back to the past yes. at this particular moment and the fact that you are still with us. Robert yes. Grenier, former CIA agent, writes yes. his book, 88 Days to Kandahar. Yes, I've seen that book. Part that of you, yes. Hamid Karzai, yes. nearly died by mistake in an American missile strike. Right, yes. That you were lucky to survive, you had some facial damage, yes. 40 plus people yes. were killed. Yes, unfortunately, yes. Remember that for us, if you would, here on this program, <clears throat> and then reflect on the fact that you're still here today. I remember that day very well. It was uh, the month of Ramadan, and very cold. This was before you became president? This was just the day I was declared as the interim leader in Bonn, just that day. Uh, just half an hour before I got in front from Bone that by, by Lise Doucet, our, our, our good friend in the BBC, she called me. Uh, it's, it's, it's about nine in the morning and I was feeling very cold. And I looked up and I saw a very nice um, hill with lots of sunshine on it and some guys sitting there. So I thought, well, let me go up to that hill it, it will be a walk as well, and, and I'll warm up there uh, in the sunshine. As I began to walk towards that hill, taking some 20, 30 steps, someone called me from, from behind and said, well, some elders are here from a district in, in, in Kandahar. And I said, who are those elders? He mentioned some names. I knew them. They were, they were very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 
people that I knew and, and, and uh, people that uh, were uh, respectable and, and, and so I couldn't continue. Um, uh, you had to, to stay place. with them. I, I, I came back, I came back to sit with them and uh, got a blanket and wrapped it around myself and sat with them. The moment I sat, there was an explosion and windows and things broke in and uh, then they took me out uh, to a hillside uh, where my, my face was being cleaned from shrapnel and brand and all that. That's where BBC Lise Doucette called me and said, well, Mr. Karzai, you're, you've been elected as the uh, head of the interim government. So it was an eventful day in lots of ways. Lucky to survive? Very and Lucky much. to be still here today with a future to play in Afghanistan? I hope I can play um, uh, for the good of the Afghan people and for the region.